It's coming. Good afternoon, members. Uh, good afternoon to the public. We're happy that you are here. Whether you are joining us in person or online, uh, we are excited that you're here. And I'll call uh, to order the Committee on Jobs and Economic Development. And it is Wednesday, March 20th. Uh, we have a quorum. Quorum is present. I always like to give a pathway or at least a some guidance as to how today is going to look. We'll be hearing my bill, Senate File 4027, for me, which is our policy bill, and we'll kind of go through that. And then we'll have Senate File 3502 from Senator May Quaid, and Senate File 4435 from Senator Herr, uh, and Senate File 4331 from Senator Hoffman. You may have seen on the agenda earlier that there was Senate File 4446 from Senator Hoschild, and we will not be hearing that bill today, just so that everyone is uh, clear on that. Uh, we also make sure it's, it's clear outside of my bill that is going to be our policy bill, that when other testifiers come up, uh, outside of the presenting author, uh, other testimony will be relegated and timed to two minutes maximum. So just want to make sure that you know that we'll keep track of that as well, because we like to make sure that everything goes fluidly. Uh, and at, so with that being said, as you can see, we have a full agenda today, so we'll, we will begin. Uh, and so I'm going to ask our worthy and, and uh, wonderful Vice Chair, Senator Muhammad, to come and start chairing. And we'll begin with Senate File 4027. My understanding is that we have um, folks ready to come and forward and speak about the separate sections of the bill. Uh, yes. Um, go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you to the committee. Uh, thank you to all those who worked hard on our policy bill here today. And I'm here to present Senate File 4027. Um, I believe the bill is really fairly straightforward, uh, but we have a number of folks in the audience who can speak to in-depth questions if members have them. So just know that you may not see anyone sitting up here with me, but they're in the back. So if there's a section or a question, they are prepared to come forward. Um, first, before we pr uh, uh, go forward, I would like to move the A8 amendment, which is addressing Senator Nelson's concerns as well as other members uh, to the section of the bill from Senate File 4925 as amended, which will, which we heard on Monday. So I'd like to move that amendment now, if possible, Madam Chair, the A8 amendment. Okay, Senator uh, Champion moves the A8 amendment. All those, are there, is there any discussion on the amendment? I'm looking for it, Madam Chair. No? Uh, we're looking for it. Okay. <clears throat> we'll give it a minute. Could Senator Champion explain it? Senator Champion, you want to explain the amendment, or maybe council? Will? Yeah. So, so the, uh, herein lies the concerns that um, Senator Nelson had around the rate of 10 percent, and there was that ongoing conversation about that and how that should be written. It's my understanding that uh, the amendment, the A8 amendment, reflects the proposed changes that Senator Nelson wanted addressed. If you need anything much more in-depth with that, I can call up a testifier who can talk even more about the A8 amendment. Awesome. Um, all those in favor for the amendment, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say nay. The motion prevails. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Thank you for helping me get the bill in the shape that we want it to, to be in, and thank you to all, uh, to all for your feedback and for working with, with Senator Putnam on this. There are four sections, members of the bill, composed of these Senate files. So Senate file 4027, my bill, which originally was just one small policy provision, but if you recall, we did a delete all to wrap all six small policy provisions that were inadvertently split up by the reviser, which we... Uh, when they were intended to be in one bill from deed. We made that change in committee on March 6th, as you know. That language has not changed. However, we obviously amended additional language from three other bills we heard in committee after the language in the bill. So Deputy Commissioner, uh, Commissioners Kevin McKinnon, 
and Mark Majors are here in the audience to answer the questions uh, on this section that you may have. Next, uh, we have uh, Senate File 4925 language from Senator Putnam, which we heard on Monday, and we just amended with the A8 amendment to incorporate your feedback. Um, Carrie Johnson, as you probably heard on Monday, she is with us again. She's from the Metropolitan, Metropolitan Consortium of Community Developers is here. If you have any additional questions or concerns you'd like to address or discuss on that section. And remember, that was the group they got together with other stakeholders and they came with the recommendations and they presented those recommendations. So uh, Senate File 4925 reflects those recommendations. Um, after that, we have the language from Senate File 4172 from Senator Friends and Marty Seifert. And uh, he is in the audience. There he is over there. Uh, so if anyone will have any questions on that section, again, this is that federal conformity language, and we believe it to be non-controversial. Uh, thank you to Senator Friends and, and, and Mr. Seifert for helping bring this forward. But la and last, but certainly not least, we have the language from, from Senate File 3756 from S Senator Hochschild, which simply raises the caps from 5 million to 10 million on line 23.18 and 23.3 and 24.19 of the bill. We also increased the cap from 7 million to 12 million on line 24.32. And as you heard in the testimony on Monday, this increase will help our local communities afford, uh, afford to take on water treatment projects that the Public Facilities Authority distributes grants to help them complete. So we do have Jeff Freeman from the, the Public Facilities Authority is here to help address any questions you may have on this section. Members, that's all I got. That's all the... Uh, uh, those are all the provisions that are in uh, Senate File uh, uh, 4027. At this time, we can entertain any questions um, or any amendments that you may have. And I know that there were some amendments. I know that there's a, 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 a potential A4, and there's a potential A5, a potential A6, and a potential A7. So whoever wants to go in any particular order is fine. And, and when that section is discussed, I'll have uh, one of my testifiers come up and answer any and all questions uh, uh, that pertains to that amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Champion. Senator Draham. Thank you, Chair Muhammad. And thank you, Senator Champion, for uh, bringing the bill forward. Um, I have two amendments I, I think I mentioned briefly to you uh, before session. Um, the first would be the A6 amendment. Um, so that would be um, page two, delete section two and insert the cost limitation uh, language. Um, and I don't know if, uh, did you find it? I did. Okay, I have it. The, the A6 amendment. Okay. And so is there anything, else, Madam Chair, is there anything else that Senator Draham wants to say about the A6, or should I have the department come up and talk about why, um, or my testifier, why uh, the changes were made in our underlining uh, Senate file 4027? Senator Draham, do you have anything else to add, or do you want the... I think it would be great to hear from the department. Okay, perfect. So I guess we'll take somebody from the department. Madam Chair, we have uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, Mark Majors, who is going to tackle this, in, and I'm sure that he'll introduce himself for the record. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Mark Majors, Deputy Commissioner for Workforce Development at DEED. Um, Madam Chair and committee members, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, just kind of recapping on my testimony from last week, uh, where we talked about the 10% uh, cap on this. As I mentioned during that time, and I'll repeat it, so forgive me, is that indeed we have tendency to, uh, for our workforce development grants, the grants range everywhere from approximately about $40,000 all the way up to a maximum of $750,000. 
Um, the 10%, as you can do the calculation, I won't do that for you all, but I know you, you handle it, um, is, is a minimum amount of dollars given the amount of work that we're asking our community-based organizations, our partners, to do. Uh, this is feedback that I've received, as well as the department has received, that it is ex extremely difficult uh, to, with the limited dollars for admin, to actually do the level of oversight that I think that this committee and other other age, uh, excuse me, other legislative bodies expect um, to do with the minimum dollars that are available. This will allow, uh, ex while allowing the uh, agencies to have an expanded range of dollars to spend on administrative dollars will help them to ensure that they're hiring the staff, acquiring the equipment that they need in order to deliver the services. As I mentioned again last week, there's four steps that in which DEED goes through to actually look at budgeting. One, again, is at risk. We do risk assessments at the beginning uh, before any awards are let. Two is that once the RFPs, uh, once the award is made, we do look at the budget and do a comparison to the work that's being offered up or uh, suggested. Three, there are monitoring that we do, we perform during the course of the, of the training um, where services are provided. So we are actually evaluating the, uh, the spending that the grantees are going through during, throughout the time of their um, of the grant. And then lastly, if there's an amendment to the proposed budget at any time, that also goes under a, le under a level of scrutiny. So we have four types of checks and balances to make the assessment of whether or not that the actual uh, admin dollars or training dollars or supportive services actually coincide with the actual work that's supposed to be done during that time. And I know, that, again, this is, you know, we're looking at this from a perspective of, that we've received from our partners. This is not DEED just at coming in and asking for it. This is partners throughout the state who have raised this and asking for this to be uncapped. Uh, uncapped. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Majors. Sure. Senator Champion, or did um, you have something to add? Uh, uh, maybe if, uh, uh, I mean, I think, uh, Madam Chair, that the Deputy Commissioner did a really good job of, of articulating their thinking behind uh, this proposed policy change. It gives them more discretion to look at uh, what makes sense based on the work that is being uh, put forward. We know as a guiding principle, we try to make sure that we control administrative costs and we do not want entities having high administrative costs and so much of money being sucked up in uh, their admin costs. But we also recognize that there's work that needs to be done and we want to be respectful of that work and still keep our administrative costs down. So it doesn't mean right. that they're going to get any more money. We just want to be reasonable and thoughtful. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Chambi. Senator Draham, do you want to move the amendment? I, I would like to move, but I'd like to add a comment before we go to that. If Sounds I could. good. And, and thank you both for your comments. And, and I, I understand what you're trying to get at, but you know, the way I approach it is that we have, what, 5 10% of the nonprofits that come in through those doors, sit down here, and beg for money. Um, it would be nice to help out more of the nonprofits that are doing good work. And if we aren't a little careful and have guide rails in statute that dictate overhead expenses, I'll call it, administrative costs. Um, I, I think it's just a crack for abuse, and we've seen plenty of abuse. So I, I think this is comfort language. I like it. I think almost every member on this committee at one time or another has talked about this issue. Um, I, I, I think it's just common sense we keep it the way it is, and I appreciate the agency's work. I understand the perspective where you're coming. I understand the perspective of the nonprofits. Um, but unfortunately, we're in a position where we can't fund everybody. Um, and we need to make sure that those dollars are being used what, <coughs> for what the intent is. So I, I urge everybody to vote yes, and I do move the A6. Thank you. Madam Chair. Senator Champion. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I would hope that the committee would not adopt the A... A6. A6, A6. A6 amendment uh, for a couple reasons. One, I do think 
the department is our backstop when we think in terms of uh, their discretion. They understand what is needed in the marketplace. They're not willing to give any more uh, to any particular person for administrative costs than what is necessary. And we've seen that we could trust the work of DEED, even if we have questions about others, we can certainly uh, trust the work of DEED and know that they will uh, uh, not only articulate but implement our uh, careful, careful consideration when we think in terms of um, uh, uh, administrative costs and apply the guardrails that we've talked about. So I would ask the committee not to adopt the A6 Amendment. Thank you, Senator Champion. Senator Pat. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, or Madam Chair, and, and Senator Dreheim for bringing this amendment. And I certainly appreciate, you know, where the department has come from. We've been having this discussion uh, for many years. But members, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that we, we allocate these grant funds. The administrative fee is meant to cover the cost in addition to what their normal uh, responsibilities are. And what we found is that we're not hiring people to take these. This is, DEED pretty much has the overhead they need uh, in order to administer these grants. This is why they're built in part, they built an entire uh, department or, or portion of their organization around grant administration. And, and you know, I might say they, they do it better than most of the other agencies in the, in the state. To say that, you know, to, to Senator Dreheim's point, to put, to put some, some guardrails around this, to make sure that the funds that, you know, whether it's, it's for deed or whether it's for the, the uh, nonprofit, um, who should have the capacity to manage these grants if they're coming to us, um, I think is more than reasonable. And I personally, I think, I think 10% is a little rich, but, um, I think it's a good start for us, and we should have dropped the, the Dreham Amendment. Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and, and thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Pratt, for your, your thoughtfulness and, and comments, and of course, those of, of Senator Dreheim. And we understand, we're on the same page as it pertains to really making sure that we keep uh, those guardrails in place, but, but we do, uh, and I think that we should trust the commissioner and indeed in order to make that call based on the work that they've already done, what they're seeing in the marketplace, and how to best um, address the concerns that have been articulated and what they see. Uh, we don't want anything that was, that's going to interfere with the work being done um, out in public. So with that being said, Madam Chair, I hope that we will continue to have the discussion, but for today, um, uh, that it asked the committee not to adopt the A6 amendment. Okay. Members, any other discussion on the A6 amendment? Senator Pratt? Roll call? Okay. Shemika will do the roll call. Chair Champion? No. Vice Chair Muhammad? No. Ranking Member Dreheim? Yes. Senator Gustafson? No. Senator Herr? No. Senator Housley? Aye. Senator Pratt? Aye. Senator Putnam? No. Senator Nelson? That there being four yeses and five nays, the motion does not prevail. Or the amendment does not prevail. Very close. Um, any other discussions on the, Senator Draham? You have another amendment. Thank you, uh, Chair Mohammed and um, members. Thank you for the discussion on that amendment. Um, I have one other amendment I'd like to offer, and that would be the A7 amendment. Senator 
Senator Jim, do you want to explain the A7 amendment? Yeah, it's pretty simple, um, members. It deletes on line 10.27, uh, it de deletes the repealer. And the repealer is um, section 116J435. And I don't know if we could have our fantastic nonpartisan staff um, explain uh, no explain that. Okay, Ms. Fontaine. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, is this um, regarding the priority section uh, in the program, Senator Jahan? Uh, my understanding is the way it's drafted. Um, Proprietary technology, right? Would be, oh, let me. No, I got the wrong section. Yeah, the priorities. You're right. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and members, or Madam Chair and members, and Senator Draham. So I, I believe when um, the department testified earlier, they are doing a whole sort of reorganizing um, of this particular statute for this program. And as I read it, and as um, the department testified, they are rolling the priorities into sort of the criteria, and they just kind of were rethinking the configuration. But if the department wants to come up and, and just verify that that's what they were trying to do, that was kind of my read of it, that um, the priorities were, were sort of being brought up into the criteria section, and it was just a reworking um, to make it work better for the department. But um, Deputy Commissioner McKinnon could, could answer that. Mr. McKinnon? Yes. Uh, uh, if I can just jump in, and then I will have the Senator department um, uh, further articulate it, uh, what they're doing. That is correct, what General Counsel said. If you look at on page 10, uh, you also see where uh, the things from uh, it, that were placed in the repealer are now in that section, so you're not taking away any of the uh, the criteria or the guidance from the repealer, it is now embedded on page 10 and, and other places. So with that, um, uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, McKinnon can confirm what I'm saying and then speak a little more about it. Mr. Thank you, McKinnon. Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Kevin McKinnon, Deputy Commissioner for Economic Development uh, at the uh, Senator Champion, that is uh, correct. Uh, we have uh, reorganized this, the criteria um, that were previously in Subdivision 5 under priorities. Um, the majority of them are included in this, such as um, the ability to attract uh, substantial investment, uh, the economic benefit to the city or county, very similar to how we run the uh, its sister program, the BDPI um, program. Uh, it also retains that uh, projects aren't just relocating from one city to another, uh, and uh, also, of course, uh, the job creation aspects of uh, why we do uh, these programs to begin with. Uh, so that's the reason for the repeal of those priorities. There's a few other uh, pieces in there, proximity to public transit, um, and uh, some of the other uh, public benefits that are articulated uh, generally in an application process that communities make of us uh, anyway. And Madam Chair, if you, could, if you look at line 10.18 and 10.19, it still talks about the project is expected to create or retain full-time jobs. So it doesn't really remove anything. Again, it's reorganizing and putting the necessary uh, guidance uh, uh, more in the bill itself. Thank you, Senator Champion. Senator Draham. Thank you. And, and thank you, Deputy Commissioner, um, for your comments. Um, you know, the part I didn't find that with the revamp and deletion of this section is that grants must be made for public infrastructure that, in the Commissioner's judgment, provide the highest return in public benefits for the public cost incurred. Senator uh, Champion. Uh, uh, so the cost-benefit analysis, very loose language that's in statute now. Um, it, can, can you point that out on this page? Yes. Uh, Senator Champion, you have to go through the chair. 
I'm sorry. Uh, Madam Chair, you're right. Madam Chair, she was waiting all day to get me on that. I know, <laughs> I know she was. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, to Senator Dreheim's question, if you look at line 10.8 uh, uh, through 10.10, uh, uh, I believe this is the section that you're talking about. The project is expected to result in or will attract substantially public and private capital investment and provide substantial economic benefit to the county or city in which the project would be located. I believe that addresses your concern, or maybe it doesn't, unless there's another space. Senator Draham. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Champion. You know, it. To me, it, it, it doesn't quite line up to what was in statute before, and, and that's my intent of reversing the repealer. I, I kind of understand the other language that's in here, um, but if we look at the, the second sentence, more or less, on that subsection five uh, under priorities, you know, it provides the highest return in public benefit for the public cost incurred. That's a cost benefit analysis. And, you know, so that's what's missing in this language. So I, I get the other parts that you did, and I, I understand why you're doing it, but I think that's a pretty important piece. And, and I think the, the people of Minnesota the public would expect that. Um, and I'm sure that is something that is wrestled with in, in within your own department. but. I think it needs to be in statute like it is now. So. Uh, Senator Draham. Senator Champion. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, what, uh, what we can commit to Senator Draham, if there's something uh, that you can work with the department on, if there's something else that they might be able to uh, provide in this language to, that gets to your point, if they don't already feel like it's already there, uh, we are certainly open to that, but for, today, but for today's purposes, I'd ask that the committee not adopt the A7 amendment. I don't know if there's someplace else in the, in the criteria that would be Mr. helpful McKenna. to point out. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Draham. Yes, we'd be happy to uh, obviously uh, work with you if there's more comfort language that's uh, that's needed. The um, what I would say is when we do these types of awards, yes, there has to be tax base created. Yes, there has to be uh, all the outcomes that are that are ultimately expected, or the unfortunately the community does have to pay these funds back. Um, and what I would uh, additionally say uh, is that when we have these large infrastructure projects, ultimately uh, these are grants to help uh, the communities uh, provide that infrastructure to support uh, not only that use, but um, uh, potentially other uses that have a similar need from a land perspective. So thank you. Any other discussion on the A7 amendment? Okay. Um, Senator Jaham, do you want to move the amendment? I would still, yeah. Okay. Um, so all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those that are opposed say nay. No. Nay. The motion does not prevail. All right. Any other discussion on the bill? Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, before, I, before I offer an amendment, let me just... Uh, you know, say a few things. Senator Champion and I have been talking about workforce. De I'm sorry, I'll get closer. Uh, Senator Champion and I have been talking about workforce development for many, many years. Um, you know, as we continue to uh, find a workforce shortage that we've, you know, seen coming for almost a decade as the demographics uh, show that Minnesota is growing older and, and we've got fewer, you know, fewer young people coming in to, to fill those jobs. Um, we are having to get more creative in how we uh, look at workforce development. Um, and I've shared, you know, I've shared with Senator Champion and others, you know, some of the stories in my district. And one I'm particularly proud of is, is we've got um, an electrical contractor that brings kids on straight out of high school. He uh, trains them through uh, and provides classwork for them all the way uh, to journeyman status, and these kids walk out, and uh, most of them stay with him voluntarily. Uh, but they can take that uh, they can take that credential anywhere they want. 
Uh, I've talked to manufacturers. They're taking uh, people with very, very few skills and up, up training them not only to an entry level job, but up training them to the point where they are getting very um, good paying careers. And, and Senator Champion and I have talked about this, uh, uh, this A5 amendment I'd like to introduce. Senator Champion and I have talked about this concept on, on multiple occasions and uh, this language just came together yesterday. Um, and so I didn't get a chance to talk to him, but Madam Chair, I'd like to offer the A5 amendment. Okay, Senator Pratt moves the A5 amendment. It should be in your packets. Senator Pratt, you wanna explain the A5 amendment? Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, the A5 amendment recognizes that um, we're, we're relying on many of our employers to do workforce development, to do those basic skills, not only for those entry level jobs, but also uh, to develop skills on an ongoing basis. Um, we just you know, heard a, a pilot program from Shakopee the other day about a public-private partnership. And this would be a, a little bit different where we have um, employers paying a special assessment into the Workforce Development Fund. And yet they're providing workforce development for their own, for their own workforce and not getting any of that benefit. They're paying in an additional tax, but, but they can't recoup any of that money for, um, for their own expenses. Uh, to upskill their employees. And, and what we really want to do, Madam Chair, is focus this on our smallest employers, those with 100 employees or less, to say that they can apply back to deed for a refund on the, on the uh, special assessment they paid into the Workforce Development Fund. And then there would be a report back to the legislature to make sure that we keep that fund healthy for the um, for the dislocated worker program, because we certainly don't want to lose, you know, that program, which has been uh, so crucial when we have uh, big layoff uh, events. We want to make sure that that's whole, but recognize our small employers are doing a lot of the work that the Workforce Development Fund was initially set up to do, and we think that they ought to be able to recoup some of those expenses. So uh, with that, Madam Chair, I'll stand for any questions and ask members to support the E5 amendment. Okay. Senator Champion to the amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator, Senator Pratt, as usual, for your thoughtfulness around some of these important issues. Uh, and uh, Senator Pratt is right that we've had a, a ton of conversations <laughs> about these things and the creative ways by which to do things. Uh, and I recognize that uh, we're always looking for ways to uh, benefit small businesses and how do we help make sure that they're able to use resources in a meaningful way. Uh, upscaling uh, upskilling, um, uh, 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 employees is very important, right? And, uh, uh, but there is a special assessment and there's a reason for this special assessment. Um, and, and I understand what Senator Pratt is attempting to do is to recoup uh, some of the revenue that uh, a small employer and others have used in order to provide training. Uh, and uh, and I know that there would be a report, and I I, I recognize that. But the A5 amendment, uh, it, uh, D doesn't have a great way as a state agency to know how many employees you have at every time at every business. Uh, and our workforce grows and shrinks more than more than any state in the country because of seasoned workers, etc. There are all these rationales for it, and, virtu and so it's virtually impossible to do this. Uh, uh, I recognize that others have been talking about this, the Chamber's been talking about it, and it's all this notion of give the tax back to the employer, but it's really difficult in my opinion, And but I'm gonna have Deed come up and talk about it because I don't work at Deed, I'm a policy uh, person. But one thing that is, uh, 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 that's clear, at least from what I understand it, is that details of, being, uh, of them being able to administer this would require a lot, of, uh, a lot more thought and build out to, to do it. So it is 100% at any point, whether it's they have 100 employees at any point in the year, only when it goes below 100, but what about then going back over 100? So I just think that the, the uncertainty of it and the additional thought that needs to happen, uh, so I will ask Deputy Commissioner 
Mark Majors or Deputy Commissioner Kevin McKinnon to speak to this issue. But as of right now, I think more time is needed for this idea and it's for that reason that, you hear from, that you've heard from me and then hopefully from Dee that I, I will probably ask you not to adopt the A5 amendment. Okay, Mr. Majors. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, I have to agree with um, the chair on, on this. And I appreciate the, the comments around we were trying to be uh, creative during this time, and we certainly are. That's why we've actually asked for the dislocated worker eligibility requirements to be expanded, not restricted, um, to who, be, who can be served with uh, funding. But in terms of the Workforce Development Fund, the Workforce Development Fund is actually a very important fund for, work for, uh, for the state. Um, it not only supplies funding to DEED, but also the Department of Labor and Industry receives funding through this. Our vocational rehab uh, uh, program receives funding, but also what we call our local workforce development uh, areas, which we have 16 of them across the state, and they receive formula dollars from the Workforce Development Fund. Now, let me just be very clear. These local workforce development areas are actually led by employers. Um, and who are in some cases our recipient of these dollars. Um, so those fund, uh, they would be impacted by this gravely. In addition to the um, Minnesota Jobs Skills Partnership, there's an opportunity uh, board, there's an opportunity for employers to actually go and actually ask for dollars for this, with assistance for training. So they are not, employers are not shut out from actually accessing the dollars that they do put forward in this. And then I'll just say, lastly, obviously, this has a great deal administrative burdensome. You're adding additional work on deed, as, as the chair mentioned, is to go assess whether it's 100 folks or not. Uh, now you're getting us into a whole billing scenario where then we're going to rebuild. I have to go back and refund dollars. So administratively, there it would be very challenging. I do believe that the employers can benefit from it if they seek to do so. The, the funding is there for them to apply for a grant along with some of our partners so that they can access these dollars. And it's just so important for us to continue to be creative as we think about addressing our labor shortage and doing that in partnership with our employer partners, which is what our local workforce development areas do on a daily basis. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Hemp, did you have something to add to the amendment? Or Senator Pratt? Thank you, Chair, and, and the, thank you, Deputy Commissioner and Senator Champion. Um, you know, just interacting with businesses all over the state, most businesses want to train their own employees. And I, I think Senator Pratt's amendment here kind of gets to the smaller end of those employees, or employers, excuse me, um, that probably don't want to apply for any grant from DEED. They probably don't have the personnel to do that. They're too busy servicing HVAC systems or plumbing or electricians or whatever they do, uh, build widgets. Um, and they love what they do and they, they just need more employees. And, and I think anything we could do to help people on a career path is the whole goal of everybody here in this room, more than likely. Um, I can't think of someone better to do that training than someone that wants them to be a coworker with them. And I, I, I know there would be a little administrative work on this, but I, I, I think Senator Pratt's on the right track. If we want effective training, why not have the people that do it every day have that training for these really small businesses. Um, you know, 100, 100 employees really isn't that many. Um, you know, at, at my peak, I, we had 110. Um, it's a lot of people, I get it, but you're still a small business. Um, you know, so I, I hope we can work on this proposal. Um, I think it's probably more effective than some of the other things we already fund. Um, and and I, I do think we could maybe put a little guardrails on this amendment to make sure we target maybe certain industries. Um, but 
I, I, I'm really in favor of this. Thank you, Senator Pratt, for bringing it forward. Madam Senator Chair. Pratt. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and just hopefully to, to close this out. You know, Senator Champion talked about this as a tax break and a tax benefit for businesses. That's not how I see it. I see this as a benefit for employees. When you look at the amendment, must be used to upscale current entry-level employees for training that leads to an increased salary or increased opportunities for career advancement. We've had a lot of, dis you know, we're, we're hearing discussion around increasing minimum wage, increasing this, increasing that. What we should be doing is preparing people to take on those roles that create those higher wages, that incent them to get into those higher wages. And the reason, Senator Champion, I think that this is an employee-focused amendment rather than an employer-focused amendment is that this training may not be going on today because the small business can't afford it. But with a rebate program, maybe they could bring that training in and do it in-house and benefit themselves with a better trained workforce and, and better productivity and, and, and the ability to pay better wages than some new state mandate. Um, we tend to think about third-party providers here. We've had a lot of them come through. And, and I think we have to break that mindset. We have to break that that perspective that we always have to have third party. This That might have been the case 25 years ago when we had a 6% unemployment rate and um, we were, you know, we weren't dealing with the labor shortages that we are today. And the report is not just to be an informational report. And the reason we're targeting the very smallest businesses is to protect the Workforce Development Fund for all the things that the Assistant Commissioner said are there. And we're, you know, and and, you know, nobody can pull out more than they've put in. It's a rebate. It's not, it's not a grant, right? So, so by that very nature, they can only pull out what they've, what they've put into the fund. And I think those are the protections that we're looking for um, that the agency could and should be, feel comfortable with. I'm happy to have further conversation with them uh, on that. But this is an employee centered amendment, not an employer centered amendment. And I, I just want to make that perfectly clear because we need Minnesotans to be able to take on some of the most highly skilled jobs. Um, we've talked for years about becoming a technology hub, about, you know, back, back when we were kids, Senator, this was, this was a technology hub. Honeywell helped put men on the moon. Some of the, some of the greatest innovations, and we still have some great technology here, but some of the greatest innovations in the world were, were developed here in Minnesota. And we need to figure out how to bring that back. And, and I don't know that we're going to get the big behemoth corporations again, but boy, we've got a lot of smart people starting their own businesses. And wouldn't it be great to help them train their employees to be the best they can? And so, Madam Chair, I, I would like to uh, request a roll call on the A5 amendment. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Trampy, do you want to add anything to the discussion? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. I don't think there's any disagreement about the fact that we always want to make sure that we have a highly skilled workforce. And I don't think uh, there's a disagreement that we should do everything we can to support small business employees as well as owners. I just think that the A5 amendment uh, misses the mark. Uh, uh, although there's a commitment from us to continue to have this discussion uh, in the future because I think we always want to entertain everything we can. Let me highlight a couple points that uh, between the comments of Senator Dreheim and the comments of Senator Pratt that I think um, shines a light as to why uh, the A5 amendment should not be adopted. So Senator Dreheim, Madam Chair, says Individuals, uh, employers should be able to train their own employees. Uh, in fact, currently, they can. They can do that right now. There's nothing that changes that. In fact, 
uh, they can have access to the dollars that are currently in the very fund that Senator Pratt wants to take money from. You know how they can do that? They can ask. They can apply. They can say to Deed, hey, look at what we're going to do. And Deed would say, yes, absolutely. Give us, uh, we'll enter into this. Uh, we'll give you the application. Here's what you got to prove and show to us. And they would give them, give them the nod to go forward. So what happens? The employer gets money in order to, to do their training. The employees get the opportunity to be trained by their employer. We're also supporting uh, a alignment of training even for colleges and techs uh, when, when we think in terms of others who are going in the marketplace they, uh, 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 going forward. So they can train. They can have access to the money. There's nothing that says that they can't have access, access to the money. And even though I know that Senator Pratt says 100 employees is not big, but they're still recognized as a small business, we understand that is something that can continue to go forward. But there's something else that I don't want you to miss. And if I'm wrong, the deputy commissioner can correct me. He says not only can identify employers articulate to deed what they want to do around training and, and, and submit an application and get grant money in order to do it for their own employees, but there are other people who benefit from this fund as well. And, and he gave and he articulated a long list of others who benefit. So we don't want to say just this industry or this or another industry, there's an opportunity for our small businesses across our great state, regardless of what profession they're in, can apply for the funds and get the support that they need. So we are, in fact, currently, right now, uh, helping small employers every single day. So I will be happy for this committee to uh, not adopt the A5 Amendment and know with clarity that you're already helping small businesses because there's nothing that would suggest that you're not help helping small businesses as, as we sit here right now today. Now, can we do better and consider other creative options? Absolutely. Do we have a commitment to do that with Senator Pratt? We absolutely do because we see that as a guiding principle. I'm just saying today the proposal that is before this, this wonderful a committee should not be adopted. So the A5 should not be adopted. And I'll ask uh, Deputy Commissioner Mark Majors if he has any additional comments. Mr. Majors. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I, I wholeheartedly uh, agree with uh, the chair champion. Um, always open to having conversations, um, other conversations, Senator Pratt and others um, about this. But I think where we stand now with the way that the fund operates now, I think it does serve multiple uh, in, in multiple entities um, in a fair and equitable way. Okay. Um, Senator Pratt. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate that offer. Um, and I appreciate Senator Champion's explanation. We give tens of millions of dollars uh, every budget cycle to third-party providers. I don't think there's a concern with these small employers who may not be taking advantage of this because it's difficult to access as a way to um, uh, streamline the process and, and create more opportunities uh, for employees. So I think Senator Champion and I have a, a very different perspective on, on, the, uh, on the health of the Workforce Development Fund. I certainly don't want to hurt any of the, the organizations that are uh, currently relying on those monies, which is why we, we so very specifically targeted this to this, um, to this small group and have that report coming so that we assure that we don't uh, take that fund below a reasonable letter, uh, level. And, and Madam Chair, I wanted to um, revise my request for a roll call vote to be printed in the journal. Okay, Senator Pratt asked for a roll call to be printed to the journal. We will ask Shamika Bogan to help us with the roll call. Okay. Chair Champion? No. Vice Chair Muhammad? No. Ranking Member Dreheim? Yes. Senator Gustafson? No. Senator Herr? No. Senator Housley? Yes. Senator Pratt? 
Yes. Senator Putnam? No. Senator Nelson? There being four yeses and five nays, the motion, the amendment does not prevail. All right, any other discussions on the bill? Senator Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have the A4 amendment. Okay. Senator Nelson moves the A4 amendment. Uh, it should be in your packet. Senator Nelson, you want to tell us a little bit about the A4 amendment? Yes, uh, the A4 amendment uh, just adds some um, requirements for larger grants, grants exceeding uh, $500,000 or more. Uh, and this amendment just simply requires that the commissioner submit uh, draft measurements uh, to MMB and consult with them uh, and budget on these measures. And so I think it's critically important that we know what we're trying to measure. And I think it's important when we're looking at large grants like this that there actually be some um, specific uh, measurements that we're trying to obtain. Um, that is uh, the uh, first part of the amendment. And then uh, paragraph B uh, just um, mentions that um, there needs to be a summary of how the funds were used. Again, just good government, good transparency. Um, and then a final report needs to come to the legislature within 90 days. Um, again, I think it's just good government, transparency, building a confidence in, in what we're doing here. Okay, Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Nelson, for your uh, A4 amendment. Um, as, as this particular committee knows that uh, D does a really thorough job as it, uh, uh, when it comes to um, contracts with, with uh, uh, other agents, uh, other um, grantees, for, for lack of a better word. Uh, they have a num number of accountability notions that's already in place. They also have to do reporting that is provided to us. When I read this A4 amendment, thank you, Senator Nelson, for your guidance on it, because I was trying to figure out what you were trying to do there, and I think this is work that uh, a substantial amount of it has already been done by deed already, so to do this would only be duplicative, and some of it may be a little more challenging. Uh, but again, I'll let the department speak to that. Uh, unless I hear something different, I'm going to ask the committee not to adopt the A4 amendment but I reserve the right to come back and change my mind in the event I hear something that uh, persuades me. But uh, I'll go to Deputy Commissioner Kevin McKinnon, if that's okay, Madam Chair. Mr. McKinnon. Thank you, Madam Chair uh, and members. And uh, Deputy Commissioner Majors will uh, also comment here as this is the part of the uh, workforce system uh, reporting uh, as well. Um, there are multiple types of grants, uh, obviously, that DEED uh, makes uh, and or loans and or uh, other types of financing that we make. Uh, some are already very well prescribed in law, uh, like many of our economic development programs, which have very clear um, uh, measurements and expectations that actually dictate the amount of money that uh, that a uh, organization may may get. Uh, in addition, we are required uh, when doing uh, grants and or loans uh, to businesses uh, directly that we enter into business subsidy agreements, which uh, are very clear um, documents that if um, a, a grantee does not perform, uh, the state uh, and through deed um, is required to go and collect that grant money back. Um, much to uh, uh, many people's maybe disbelief, uh, we actually do that. Um, and in some cases, we chase people around the world in order to get money back uh, and have been successful. And, and so that is part of uh, how we deal with businesses today. Um, secondly, there's also grants for services. 
uh, that in some cases may go over five hundred thousand uh, dollars, and that's where we're providing money to others to perform services on our behalf and paying for staff, and they're uh, serving others like uh, the last discussion. Um, and in those cases, they make applications, and you negotiate the um, the uh, outcomes uh, and the measurements associated with it, uh, and. Uh, the department would then reimburse the individual grantee based on its achievement of those uh, of those goals that they set out in the application. Uh, and then, lastly, uh, there's capital investment uh, projects uh, that um, we administer through the capital investment budget. Uh, that already requires uh, significant consultation with MMB, uh, the Department of Administration's design guidelines, uh, etc. And there are very, very specific uses of uh, state capital investment dollars, as you likely know, uh, already in our grant, already in our grant contracts. Uh, furthermore, the legislature uh, often determines what. Um, we will pay for and what the reasons for doing those grants uh, that those grants are. I just will mention that all of these programs are reimbursement based uh, that we run uh, and so uh, grantees are not receiving money until they actually perform the services by the uh, Pieces that they're uh, that they set out to buy or do what they set out to do uh, in the in the grant contract, uh, and we do close out collect reports on all of these uh, all of these projects, uh, of which we do roughly I would say. 700 of these a year, uh, and uh, we do probably less than 100 that would go over $500,000. And Madam Senator Chair, Champion. if I could say something before we go on to Deputy Commissioner Mark Majors. As you look at the A4 Amendment, what is also a little concerning is if you look at what's in Subdivision 8, it doesn't take into consideration, as uh, Deputy Commissioner McKinnon says, is that these programs are reimbursed, reimbursement-based. So this says... Uh, before issuing any economic development or workforce development grant of $500,000 or more. So are they able to do it if it's less than $500,000? If it's, uh, it's, it's $499,000, right? Um, and then it goes on to say before implementing any new grant program, the commissioner, I nat naturally assume on the line uh, 1.8, that commissioner means commissioner of deed, must submit draft measurements to the commissioner of, of, of management and budget. Now, you got another commissioner now and another agency you want to pull in to, to help administer uh, the work that is supposed to be done by deed. Uh, and then the last line of it, or at least the last sentence, uh, uh, if you look at line 1.12, it says, after cons uh, uh, consultation, the commissioner must incorporate measurements agreed upon uh, through consultation with the Commissioner of Management and Budget into grant applications, requests for proposals, and contracts. Well, there was no request that says that there had to be an uh, that that there had to be a grant application uh, that's filled out a certain way that had to be um, approved by uh, the Commissioner of Management and Budget. So it's now you're having another agency serve as the watchdog, for lack of a better word, of another agency, and you're putting on additional layer for the government to govern these, themselves. Uh, and so I just think that this uh, A4 amendment is well-intentioned, but, uh, but it probably doesn't meet uh, uh, their re reporting uh, that is necessary, and DEED already does these things. So if we could go to and just get any comments from uh, Deputy Commissioner Mark Majors, that would be great. Mr. Majors. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I just want to add that um, that's uh, what Deputy Commissioner McKinnon said. It holds true for the workforce development grants as well, where we're invoice, uh, agencies invoice, and we reimburse. Um, but I also like to add on the workforce development, uh, all I mentioned earlier when we were talking about the 10 percent, that our, our grants range from 40 to $750,000. All grantees actually are required to submit 
data on the individuals that they're serving through a system what we call Workforce One, um, which generates the exact information I think that we're looking for here. And under, uh, I think, statute 116L976, it actually provides the parameters in which uh, the, the, the uniform report card um, we're, we're supposed to report out on, which we do do. Um, that report card is actually, on, actually online uh, so that anyone can go on and look at the dashboard about how programs are doing. So we are very um, transparent about our reporting. Um, and then in terms of the uh, reimbursement, we, again, we're in a reimbursement situation like uh, Deputy Commissioner McKinnon mentioned earlier. So thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, um, just a couple things. Uh, I am concerned because um, earlier today, um, we repealed 116L.17, uh, subdivision 5. And um, I could pull that up here again to look at it. But what that does, that, ha that requires priorities. Um, that requires that we show the value of the project. And so when I see that we have removed that entire subdivision, that would be subdivision five, I find that concerning. And when I look at the A4, I mean, you know, if you don't know where you're going, you're probably going to end up somewhere else. That's just kind of a, a fact of life. And if we don't know the priorities that we're seeking and we don't have an evaluation to see, oh, did we, how did we do, um, we're, we're not going to achieve the goals that we're, we're seeking. And so um, I am concerned about the earlier movement today that um, removed, uh, that was um, removing subdivision 5 in section 116L.17. Uh, that's statutes 2022. And so when I look at the amendment here before us today in the A4, uh, this is just specific, and it's not towards all the, it's just the larger grants, uh, $500,000 grants. And so when there's a couple commissioners listed in the, in the amendment, uh, Senator Champion, which certainly I understand perhaps uh, uh, I've never been one to expand government uh, unnecessarily. But what I would say is when you see the commissioner within this statute, we know it's the deed commissioner because of the context that it's in. Uh, and then, of course, um, it, then it does bring in certainly the MMB commissioner. And again, it, I think this is like necessary even more so because of what we repealed earlier today. Um, so I, I renew my motion that we do uh, past the A4, uh, that we do know what it is that we're measuring, what the priorities are, and also um, that there must be a report. Uh, and so I, um, I would renew my motion for the A4. And before I do that, I also want to say the other piece I was very concerned about in repealing uh, one 16L.17 subdivision fives, it appears that there's no repayment uh, if the grant uh, is not if not completed. So that's a different subject. But I would renew my motion that we support the A4. Um, Madam uh, Chair. Senator Champion. So a couple things. So uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Nelson, thank you for articulating your, your concerns. Uh, Senator Nelson, I'm not certain if you were here when we talked about that the uh, information that is a part of the repealer is already back into the other aspects of this bill. So what they did was that they did some reshuffling and moved those things back into the other parts of the bill. Uh, there was one section or uh, one notion that Senator Dreheim felt like the wording still didn't quite line up with the reshuffling and there's already an ongoing commitment to take a look at that and see if there's anything there. Um, so that Thank so those so those priorities that you you thought was were removed are still there. The value is still there, and the repealer um, is talked about. You you also covered the issue of of if someone doesn't fulfill the contract and whether they're going to be repaid. You don't get the money if you don't fulfill the contract. So there's nothing to be repaid because okay. if you did not fulfill the contract, you don't get the money. I remind us here. Uh, even when we talk about nonprofits, sometimes people talk about it as if there's a direct appropriation to a nonprofit and a truck is backed up to a uh, deed and the money is put in and it just goes off to the nonprofit. That's not the way this goes. It's reimbursable. It means you got to do the work first, 
that's after you got a contract and priorities and measurements and everything is there, uh, and then you have to do the work. And then you submit an invoice. That invoice will be looked at, scrutinized, all this other stuff that happens. And if you've done the work for that invoice, then you get paid. And then you got to do the work again. And that, that, that uh, system sort of repeats itself. So we don't have to worry about the issue of being repaid. The last thing that I'll say around the A4 amendment, uh, unless there's someone else that wants to say something, even in the A4 with us expanding government and having other uh, uh, commissioners looking at the work of deed, which is unnecessary, uh, when you look at lines 1.12 to 1.14, it even expands it. I briefly talked about it because it expands the MMB's in, uh, uh, participation around grant applications, requests for proposals, contracts. It just expands it. And last but certainly not least, we can assume what if the MMB commissioner doesn't agree with the commissioner of deed about something? then guess what? I guess it's missing from the contract or from the agreement because you only say that after consultation it must incorporate measurements agreed upon through consultation. I just believe that expands government, it provides oversight that's not necessary, and I would ask this com committee not to adopt the A4 amendment unless there's something else from one of my testifiers, then we should be able to go for it. Thank you, yeah. Senator Champion. Thank you. Any other discussions on the A4 amendment? Okay, all those opposed say nay. 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 All those that are in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. So the motion fails. I'm sorry. Okay, any other discussions on the bill? Okay, and Senator Champion moves the A3 amendment, A3 as amended by the A8. Yes, that's my amendment. Okay, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those that oppose say nay. Nay. The motion passes. Thank you, Senator Champion. All right. Anything else on this bill, Madam Chair, on the policy bill? To the floor. Okay. Uh, Senator Putnam moves that Senate File 4027 be passed as amended and that staff be instructed to make any minor corrections they find. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those that oppose, say nay. The motion passes. Thank you, Senator Champion. You can have your chair back. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Mohammed. Thank you. Senator Mohammed, and thank you to the committee for consideration of Senate file. Uh, 4027 as amended. Uh, members, uh, now, uh, next up on our agenda, we have Senate File 3502 from, uh, with Senator May Quay. Senator May Quay, if you'd be so kind to come to the testifier's table. And I think we also have Aaron Zimmerman and Dr. Uh, Angela K. Uh, Gepford. Gepford? Gepford. Gepford. Uh, could you approach the testifiers table? Are they here? Mm -hmm. All right. And as they are being seated, Senator uh, McQuay, before you get into the crux of your bill, I recognize that you have um, an A2 amendment. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Chair. All right. Members, uh, let's see. Senator Mohammed moves adoption of the A2 amendment. Um, uh, is that your motion, Senator Mohammed? So moved. Any questions on the A2 amendment? Seeing none, the, um, all, all in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. The A2 is adopted. 
we will now go from there. Okay, Senator McQuaid, you can uh, give us context to your uh, bill, and then a reminder to the testifiers, when she is, uh, com uh, completes her opening, then, then you all will testify, and you'll be given two minutes each in order to um, uh, talk about this bill. So thank you, and welcome to the committee, uh, Senator May Coy. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, and thank you for agreeing to hear Senate File 3502, which provides a $1 million one-time, $1 million one-time appropriation to P Fund to support LGBTQIA plus 2S families who have either relocated or are already living in Minnesota. Um, last year, we passed crucial legislation that established Minnesota as a safe haven for transgender and LGB individuals. And this legislation has become a beacon of hope and compassion for families that have been on the receiving end of anti-LGBTQ attacks nationwide. Family from across the country are making Minnesota their new home, and now it's time for us to provide needed support and access to services for those new Minnesotans and for Minnesotans who have lived here for a very long time. Senate File 3502 will relieve pressures on our healthcare workforce, strengthen our economy, and ensure that Minnesota is a place where all Minnesotans, including and especially LGBTQIA plus individuals and families can thrive. And I hope I can count on your support. Uh, thank you, Senator May Quaid. And who would you like to testify first? Go first. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, to testify, if you I, um, identify yourself for the record and go forward. Yep, my name is Aaron Zimmerman. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm with PFUND Foundation. Uh, thank you, Chair, Champion, and members of the committee. Um, uh, PFUND Foundation has a 36-year legacy as the LGBTQ plus community foundation serving our individuals, families, and organizations here in Minnesota and across the upper Midwest through our scholarships for students and grants to small businesses and nonprofits. PFUND Foundation was awarded several million, has awarded several million dollars um, over our history and utilizes a community-driven review process. Our foundation is truly for and by LGBTQ plus communities. Last year's passage of the Trans Refuge Bill was a critical step forward to protect health care providers and patients. We've seen firsthand that people from all across the country are moving here to seek safety, refuge, and a better life for themselves and for their children. Since the Trans Refuge Law passed, PFUND has convened and surveyed LGBTQ plus people and providers of gender affirming care across the upper Midwest to identify our community's biggest challenges and needs. Data from a community survey shows in the first eight months of the Trans Refuge Law, 130 individuals and 62 families have or are soon moving to Minnesota to seek refuge. Additionally, 89% said they need gender affirming care. Across all our listening sessions, surveys, and convenings, access to affordable and affirming health care and economic, economic insecurity were consistently top challenges. This bill addresses those top challenges by dedicating funds to expand Minnesota's gender-affirming care workforce, supplying health care facilities uh, with funds needed to hire, train, and support providers in this field. Providers will then seek the job skills necessary to deliver high-quality, competent, and affirming care for hundreds of patients in need. We estimate that we could add seven or more trained gender-affirming care providers over two years, and each new provider could result in 250 more patients treated each month. Thank this you so very much, Mr. Zimmerman, for your uh, testimony. If you have one last line, you can say it, but uh, if you got more than that, then your next testifier is going to have to take over. No, nope, that's okay. Thank you so much. Are you sure? You got it? All right. To the next testifier. If you'll state your name for the record, that would be great. Sure. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair Champion and committee members. My name is Dr. Angela Cade Gepford. I use they, them pronouns. I'm the Chief Education Officer and the Medical Director of the Gender Health Program at Children's Minnesota where our team is committed to providing essential health care for transgender and gender diverse youth. I'm here today to express our support for Senate File 3502. In 2023, after the passage of the Trans Refuge Bill, um, and while states around us began to ban or restrict care, our gender health program at Children's Minnesota saw a 30% increase in new patient calls to our clinic. These families are calling, hopeful that we'll be ready to welcome them with open arms and help them get the care that they need. Unfortunately, our hands are already incredibly full. Prior to the passage of the Trans Refuge Bill, our waiting list at Children's Minnesota was over a year long, and we've watched it grow. My colleagues in the Twin Cities who specialize in this healthcare are outmatched by the demand. The Trans Refuge Law was an important first step to protect essential healthcare for transgender and gender diverse youth, and now we need to improve access to that care. 
What I like about the approach in this particular bill is that we're using the expertise we already have in Minnesota to increase access to developmentally appropriate, high quality care according to well-established clinical guidelines. It's an apprenticeship approach that leverages the expertise and care systems we already have here in the Twin Cities without sacrificing the excellent quality of healthcare that Minnesotans have come to deserve and, re and need here in this state. This investment in health care infrastructure will not only improve health outcomes, it attracts families to our state who bring with them workforce skills, financial resources, real estate investment, and contribute to a culture of inclusion. We live in a country where far too many trans youth are harassed and scared to engage in their daily lives as their authentic selves. I'm proud of Minnesota for being a state that acknowledges all young people deserve to be their wonderful and authentic selves and protecting their legal right to access health care. But it's time to take the next step. It's time to make good on our promise to have room in our arms to embrace the families that need us. It's time to make sure that transgender and gender diverse young people can step into the beauty and joy of fully thriving as the gifts they are to, them, to their families and to us here in the state of Minnesota. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Senator McQuaid, and thank you, committee members. There you go, thank you so very much. Uh, any t uh, questions for the testifiers? I know I do have a question. I uh, recognize that PFUND has been around since 1987. Uh, and, um, and, 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 and can you tell me, I think you started to say that over the next two years that, that you're looking to serve an additional 250 people with this allocation, is that correct? And if so, correct, tell me if that's correct. And two, how many have you, did you serve in 2023 and 2022? Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Champion. Uh, this would be a new a new program with PFUND Foundation. We have been, you know, last year we were awarded funding through our Equity Fund Small Business Program. We testified here last year, and that program's been going really well. But this is identifying a new, uh, you know, a new situation as we're approaching the one year anniversary of the Trans Refuge Bill. Uh, and Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Senator McQuay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think the specific, um, the stat that you heard and, and we're trying to tease out there was with this grant program, um, we, they can train seven new providers who could see up to 250 patients per month, more than we're seeing right now. So it would clear up that backlog. And uh, to the testifier, um, I believe l last year we gave you how much money? How, uh, how much was it? Uh, for PFUND Foundation, it was 750000 to be spent over the biennium. Um, in partnership, Quorum, uh, the Chamber of Commerce got a $250,000 appropriation. Any other Thank questions? Because someone said last year that we didn't give PFUND and others some money. I wanted to make sure that we were very clear <laughs> that we had given some, some money last year. Um, uh, Senator Dreheim. Thank you. Um, I, I guess my question has to do with the workforce development piece of the bill, um, I, I'm just a little foggy on how this fits into workforce development. Um, you know, we're, we're going to hire people, is what I heard, uh, seven new positions. Um, but can, can we just get into what the roles will be of these people and, and um, yeah. go from there? Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Dreheim. And I can definitely let my experts speak to this more, but um, it's it, the plan is to train seven new physicians in a specific type of health care that is in great demand right now with very few providers providing it. And so it would be apprenticeship like where they would be training with um, providers that already provide that care, um, but it is highly specialized. And so it, it is very uh, time consuming and um, difficult to break into. And so this kind of financial support will help develop our workforce in this way with, with the grants. And I so, can ask my testifiers if I covered it accurately. Any other, anything else from one of the testifiers? Yeah. Are you okay with that answer? Yeah, yeah, okay. I think that, that uh, captures it. Senator Johan, follow up. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you for the answer. So um, is this like an accredited program, or is I, I, uh, this is all new to me, so please help elaborate and help me understand uh, what kind of program it is, who does the training, is, it, is the individual that does the training on staff. Um. Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. Gepfer to, to talk a little bit more about it. But it's um, uh, specific. It's it's a specialty and within healthcare, and so it, it's learning from people who have that specialty. And I'll, I'll Dr. Gepfer has it, so I'll let them explain. Sure. Dr. Thank Gepfer. you. Yeah. Thank you. If, if you identify yourself for the record, yes. and go forward. Sure. Uh, Dr. Gepfer again uh, answering. Thank you for your question, Senator. 
So uh, there are a number of accredited fellowships in pediatric medicine, and there is no specifically accredited fellowship in uh, essential health care for trans and gender diverse youth. However, those of us in the Twin Cities who provide this care have been doing it over decades and are following uh, both, both national and international standards of care. It's important to us that anyone else in this state who's providing care to young people have the benefit of our expertise and our training when they are providing that care. So I think there's a lot of well-intended um, physicians and other healthcare clinicians that really want to help young people. We want to make sure that they help them um, in a really high quality way. So this would establish uh, apprenticeship program for already practicing um, physicians. So these are people who are done with their training. They're currently seeing patients in practice, but they can come spend time with one of the programs here in the Twin Cities who's already providing this high quality care to help them learn how to do it in a way that is consistent with our international standards and guidelines. Uh, uh, Senator J.M. Thank you. And, and thank you, Doctor, for the explanation. Um, so these seven providers that will be trained, uh, where will they office out of? To the testifier. Yeah, it depends where they apply from. So some of them may be in the Twin Cities area, some of them may be in greater Minnesota. Uh, right now, the bulk of our care is um, really concentrated in the Twin Cities metro area. So many people are traveling, even in the state of Minnesota, several hours for care. Senator Joyheim. Thank you. Um, so I, I noticed on your website, uh, the PFUN website, excuse yep. me, it, it shows five states. Uh, so we're covering more than just Minnesota um, with the work you do. Um, so how do we know that the resources are going to be used and stay here in, in Minnesota? Uh, to the testifier, uh, Senator McQuaid or? or okay. Uh, thank you, Chair Champion, and, and thank you for that question. Uh, we uh, are a five-state region, uh, regional foundation, um, and we do grant making across those five states. But we, like similarly with our deed funding from last year, we are very diligent about making sure that those resources stay in Minnesota to impact Minnesotans. Um, so with this particular program, you know, so PFUN, we're a grant maker. What we would do is put an open call to healthcare institutions based in Minnesota, providing care in Minnesota, and ask already licensed physicians and other healthcare providers at the top of their you know, fully licensed um, uh, role to come and shadow or to uh, apprentice under an already established care provider and then take that care back to their home place. So we're hopefully going to see providers across the state that it won't just be in the Twin Cities. It will likely still have a, a pretty intense, uh, intensive kind of concentration there. But we are seeing as a five state foundation, people are traveling across state lines to get healthcare in this state and we want them to get quality health care. And so how can we best um, support Minnesota through this process? And just so that I'm clear, so are you saying that you're going to train seven individuals? And then what do you project? So you're projecting that those seven individuals are then going to also train up to 250 more individuals, just so, so that you can give me some clarity, that would be great. To the testifier or, or Senator McQuay. Mr. Chair, those providers would be able to see um, 250 patients per month. And so it would um, provide a lot more capacity for healthcare in the state of Minnesota and, and develop the workforce to provide that healthcare. And Senator McQuay, how do we come up with the number 250 per month? What, what assures us that they're going to see 250 uh, patients a month? Senator McQuay. Um, Mr. Chair, I'd like to turn it over to my testifier. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Champion. Um, it, that is an, an approximation, of course. We surveyed um, six of the uh, five of the six largest uh, gender affirming care providers in the Twin Cities here um, and asked them for an estimation of if they were to bring on a new um, apprentice or you know someone to participate in that program, that's what they estimated. It was a range, of course, but really it averaged around 250 patients. Uh, any other questions for the testifiers? Senator Pratt. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, you know, let me start off by just saying I'm, I'm concerned with this being uh, a workforce development fund uh, request. We just had long and lengthy conversations about the stresses that are on workforce development right now. Um, and, you know, I think if, if that's the, the kind of the tone and tenor of in, in the position of the committee, I think we have to look long and hard, especially when this is probably based on the conversation more appropriate 
to be in the Health and Human Services uh, Committee rather than than the Jobs Committee. Although I do want to I do want to compliment uh, our testifiers for coming in with only five percent. Uh, for administrative cost, I think you win the prize for being lowest so far this year. Thank you. And and hopefully a um, a standard for others uh, that are that are seeking this type of funding. Um, but Mr. Chair, I was wondering, you know, um, the last the last 990 I could find uh, for P fund was the 2021 tax year filed in 2022. I'm wondering, can you tell me how much you had in uh, in uh, revenues and contributions? Uh, in 2022 and 23? To the testifier. Um, I, so I just have to think, our fiscal year, we're on a July 1 fiscal year. What can I ask specifically what, what kind of date range you're looking at? And I'm also happy to provide our most recent 990. I'm so sorry. I'm happy Senator to take Breyer. a fiscal, oh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I apologize for the lack of protocol there for a minute, my, uh, my mistake. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and uh, uh, to the testifier, I'm, you know, I'm just looking for your fiscal year. You know, what would you report? Uh, on the tax form. To the testifier. Thank you, uh, Chair Champion. I also apologize for the lack of um, procedure there. Um, in our last fiscal year, you know, we our, our revenues were approximately 1.5 million, between 1 and 1.5 million. This year we're anticipated to be closer to, to 2.5 million in revenues. Uh, to the testifier, what did you say the last number of your anticipated amount for, was? For this current fiscal year? 2.5 million. Thank you. Uh, Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, um, you know, back in, in 2021, we were, you know, we were looking at less than a million as, as was filed on the tax form. So my concern was we were going to be more than doubling mm. uh, what was being requested. With that type of growth, I would think a lot of this work could be done within, you know, organically within your organization. But, you know, I will say again, I think this is a inappropriate use of the Workforce Development Fund. I think this ought to be in the in the uh, Health and Human Services Committee. And to the testify that that anticipated 2.5 million that you are anticipating for this year, does that include the the 750 thousand dollars that came from this committee? Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Champion. Um, that would only include uh, the first half of it because it's a reimbursable grant. We don't get the funding until we do the work and can provide adequate um, receipt of that actual work. So no, that only includes partial, uh, like plus the amount that deed has. So maybe an additional 300 out of that total. Yeah, thank you to the testifier. I just wanted to make sure that we, the committee had that clarity as well. Senator McQuay, were you gonna say something? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, I was just acknowledging that they might need my vote in a different committee and I was okay. gonna ask them that. All right, uh, Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for bringing this bill. I had a few questions that some were answered as we went through the other questions, but some some remain. And um, I, I would just note that um, I do believe this bill rightfully needs to be elsewhere. I don't see the uh, workforce development and job skills training really appropriate for the medical field. Uh, have you worked with the uh, Minnesota Board of Medical Practice? Uh, so I'm, I'm just somewhat concerned about, about that aspect of it because if I understand correctly, the million dollars is to train seven new physicians is what I heard, but then I think you uh, maybe clarified that a little bit, that it's not training physicians. We have two medical schools in the state of Minnesota, um, and uh, uh, certainly the U of M and Mayo Clinic. Um, and so, but training, new seven, training seven new physicians to see 250 patients per month is what I heard. And that's about 35 visits per month, or about 1.75 visits per per day, per person that you have here. So I'm, you know, somehow the numbers, uh, so the training just doesn't line up uh, with what I would think. And you talked about having people work to the top of their licensure, which is always important in uh, everywhere, but particularly in the medical community. And so I, I am very, I'm not sure what type of job skills and workforce development this million dollars would be used for, because I don't believe that P Fund Foundation actually trains people specifically in the medical uh, world. And so what would this million dollars 
be used for. I understand what, you, what, what, what you're saying, seven new physicians, new positions, maybe that's it, new positions, maybe not new physicians, yeah. um, but to see 250 more clients per month, which is you know 1.7 visits per position or physician <laughs> per, per day. So what would the money be used for? I'm, I'm, I'm just not clear about that. Uh, uh, anyone in particular? Like okay. Can, to to testify, I, 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 I identify yourself for the record, just so the record knows who's speaking. Okay. Uh, you want me to identify myself yes, again? Sir. Um, Aaron Zimmerman. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Champion. Um, that's a great question. So PFUND Foundation is a grant maker similar to other community foundations you might find across the state of Minnesota. Our focus is really on LGBTQ community. So no, we are not. Um, in fact, training um, any of the physicians. We're not a medical provider. You know, we're not a medical school. There's some really great ones. Uh, what we do is we provide grants uh, to institutions, including small businesses, but also our what we're proposing here is the the different hospitals and clinics uh, that might be interested in providing this uh, type of training. So we are kind of acting as a a broker, if you will, in the sense that it's really important for us to connect. Uh, on a community-wide basis, the, the institutions that would be best equipped to do this work. And uh, Senator Nelson. Oh yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So that that's, that helps clarify a little bit. It's a grant to different institutions, uh, who, and so are those institutions? If we're talking about medical training, that would be our two medical schools. Are they asking for grants for this specific type of training? And uh, do we know, is it already in uh, the medical training that is being, that, that they're seeking? Yeah. Uh, uh, to the testifier. And Mr. Chair, I'm gonna talk, uh, turn to, make way. thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna turn to Dr. Gepford. I also um, wanna just be really clear that in our DE, it's, um, it's workforce development and job skills, a, a portion, a large portion of that is this apprenticeship program. So it's for already licensed physicians. It's not um, training people to become physicians, but it's already licensed physicians who are going to work with other licensed physicians who have expertise in a specific kind of healthcare delivery in order to be able to, to deliver that healthcare and, um, in concert with the you know international and national guidelines and, and evidence, um, but it's also for wraparound services to help um, LGBTQIA plus individuals um, improve their economic and employment uh, standing, self sufficiency, and, and have pathways out of poverty as well. And so that's where the workforce development piece comes in. Is it's a you know. A, Part of it is a specific workforce development, and then the other part is the broadly workforce development in the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, and then I, Dr. Gepford might want to speak more to the medical. Uh, part. Senator McQuaid, can you clarify something that mm -hmm. you said? You said that a portion of the proceeds would be used for the tr for the training of the physicians, and and that there's this whole notion of uh, lining up and giving grants to those institutions because P Fund doesn't have physicians under its auspices. But you then said wraparound services. So if these grants are going to institutions and those institutions have pa patients because they're doctors, it sounds like, where would the wraparound services uh, 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 fit into your analysis? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I think that's the important part is that um, the, there are other organizations in the state of Minnesota who also provide those wraparound services. So, you know, someone is able to access the health care that they need to, to live their full lives as themselves. And then there's other services that are needed to be provided by other organizations. And, and I, they would apply for this competitive grant through P Fund um, that would be delivering those wraparound services related to workforce development and long term economic self sufficiency. And then how much of the $1 million would be used for competitive grants? Because I, Somehow I missed that, but but competitive grants. So so how much of this will be used for competitive grants? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Champion. Uh, all but five percent for the administrative and technical assistance overhead. So nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars at minimum, if not more. A portion going towards that physician training, and a portion to other smaller nonprofit organizations who are providing those wraparound support services to LGBTQ communities. Okay. Um, Senator Nelson, I, I jumped in, but I just wanted to clarify something that was being said. Senator Nelson, and recognize members that we have until 2.30, and we have some other bills that we have to do as well. Uh, Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the clarification that you were seeking as well. Um, so 
I still have, I mean, there are specific, so when, when you use words like apprenticeships, medical apprenticeships, those are very specific things, or medical training, or, so I'm very concerned that this, it, it sounds like some of the things you're trying to achieve need to really be looked at elsewhere. I would be looking through the health committee uh, because of the training that you're talking about. So when you're talking about training in the medical world, that really does need to go through go to health. Uh, certainly we need to hear from the Minnesota uh, Board of Medical Practice. I mean, there's just so many. Uh, un, un, I, I just think this is the wrong venue. Or maybe it's not the wrong venue, Mr. Chair. Maybe uh, I will just make a motion that this be re-referred to health. Uh, Senator Mohammed. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate my colleagues for the discussion. Thank you, Senator Bates-Wade, for bringing the bill. I think there's some confusion. One, I disagree with Senator Nelson that this should go to a different committee, because it's clear that what we're talking about is workforce and economic development. I think there's some confusion around whether some of this money will be used for economic development or for workforce um, in terms of like granting other organizations. I think that can be cleared up. This, I assume the bill is going to be laid over, but I think that this bill belongs in this committee and in this jurisdiction. Senator Nelson, any follow-up? And then I can probably provide some, some clarity as well, because, because what I think I heard is, is on the um, workforce side and, and what they're articulating as the justification for being here is because you have these, these doctors and I did hear apprentices, and I recognize that in this committee, when you use that sort of term, that's a term of art for us, right? <laughs> uh, and doctors are usually not included in that term of art, right? Um, but there being this, this ability, a need to enhance their capacity in this area in order to uh, provide uh, uh, service to not only the, the clients that they see, which I heard is probably around 250, right? But also them being in the position to also train someone else and, and say, hey, here's, here's how you provide gender affirming care uh, for, you know, those sort of things. I think that's what I heard. And then there's this, and, and so those grants in order to help those doctors would, would be given to other institutions that would apply for a grant is what I think I'm hearing, right? And I think I heard 950,000 of the million dollars would go there. The wraparound services uh, would be for other organizations who would compete for competitive grants to provide wraparound services to the target population that would, would need the treatment that the other doctors are being trained around and, and just really helping to make certain that they get the support that they need. I don't hear economic development as Senator Muhammad said, but, I, but that's what I believe I heard. And if I'm wrong or right, please correct me now because guess what, we're all going down together if we're wrong. I just want you to know, <laughs> but I want us to be really clear. So to the testifier. Uh, Chair Champion, just a quick point of clarification on the NICAN. Is There are two grant pools within the 950,000. Okay. All of it targeted towards LGBTQ communities who are, and to the, the medical field, which is seeing an undue amount of, like an unprecedented amount of need right now. And um, the workforce that's landing here, the, the families that are landing here, they are also needing those wraparound support services. So of the 950, there are two pools both aimed at economic development, one specifically within the medical field and one more broadly speaking. And Mr. Chair, I think Dr. Gepford wants to add something as well. Yes, Dr. Yeah, thank you, Chair Champion. I just wanted to clarify um, for Senator Nelson, we're not talking about um, training new doctors. We're not talking about becoming a medical school. We're not talking about any of those things. I'm, I happen to be the chief education officer at Children's Minnesota, so I'm in charge of our 800 trainees that come through our children's hospital every year. So I'm well versed in the medical training. What we're talking about is, um, say you live three hours from here in a small rural town in Minnesota and you have a hockey team and they need a, a sports medicine doctor for the hockey team and no one in that community understands how to provide sports medicine. They learned a little bit about it in medical school but they've been on a practice for 10 years and they really don't have the skill set sharp. 
So they reach out to someone here in the Twin Cities, at TRIA, at Twin Cities Ortho, someone who really specializes in providing youth sports medicine. And they say, can I come and train with your team for six months so I can get really good at this, go back to the hockey team you know, up in Mora, Minnesota, and be their sports medicine doctor? That's what we're talking about. So we're talking about board certified, Minnesota licensed physicians who are already in practice that are lacking a specific skill set for an underserved and targeted population of young people who can't get the essential health care they need and training up to seven physicians who are already in practice at institutions like Children's Minnesota or Hennepin Healthcare or places that are already providing high quality care to be able to bring that care then to the communities of Minnesotans and new families that are moving here. And Mr. Chair? Uh, uh the, the uh, last thing, uh, Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The last thing I'll add is that we worked with Deed on this bill and on this language too, just to make sure that it is the right venue, and that was the feeling from the agency as well as as the folks who are supporting this bill is that this really is related to um, workforce development and and job skills and an economic opportunity for a targeted group of people. Uh, why do you ever finish uh, Senator questions? Nelson. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, we kind of, uh, th thank you. You know, I just, my question though is if the P Fund Foundation is the right recipient of this. I understand what, what you're hoping to do. I understand though that, what I don't understand is how the P Fund Foundation is going to advance, whether it be apprenticeships or preceptorships or any of these things. I just don't see the connection with what how P Fund is going to connect with those already established medical institutions, practices, training, preceptors, all of those things. I'm missing that connection, which is why um, I think perhaps it needs to go to the health. A committee. I will withdraw my motion, Mr. Chair, only because I see the makeup of the committee and what what has transpired with with every other amendment. But I want to be clear that I do not understand the connection between this training money for medical providers and how the P fund uh, fits into that. I, I don't see that. I think it it, it needs to be uh, looked at in a broader context of our full medical um, arena. Uh, Senator Mohammed. Um, Senator McQuaid, um, I think we're seeing some wraparound services without job training uh, skills. Is there some job training component for the individuals? Senator McQuaid. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Mohammed, for the question. So there are, um, for, for the two, two grant pools, the people who would be applying for this, the specific pool that you're referencing, Senator Nelson, are the healthcare institutions themselves to house those physicians with physicians uh, that are already have that specialty. And then to your point, Senator Mohammed, there are other organizations in the state of Minnesota who provide those wraparound services, whether it's um, interview prep or support for resume writing or things like, it, Close right shelter violence prevention things that that prevent people from entering into the workforce and so those um, those organizations are the ones that would be in that second pool that serve this population that we're talking about to enter the workforce and and if I could ask this question and in that those folks in that second pool how many people are you intending to uh, serve in that pool. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. I, that is up to the organizations who are applying. So let's say an organization like uh, Rainbow Health is saying that we are going to help, you know, 45 people get into, um, to, you know, get everything that they need in order to enter the job market because of XYZ services that we provide. And then you might have a different organization like Outfront Minnesota that's like, we could do 100 because we do this really specific piece. And so I think it depends on the organization and the services that they provide and, and then capacity and, and how many, you know, how much time it takes to provide that service. So it depends on the organization and it depends on their role in these wraparound services. Some organizations do things like um, peer support groups and mental health that can serve more people than maybe something that's uh, labor intensive like finding shelter. And so, Senator McQuaid, uh, uh, even though there's the intent to lay this bill over for possible inclusion and there's a, a variety of concerns at the table, um, there might be some help because uh, one of the things it says make grants statewide for workforce development and skills, right, and not um, 
that that gets a little fuzzy even when you think in terms of like competitive grants, if there's a process for that, how that process will be considered, who will be um, uh, doing that, right? Because this committee sometimes is very detailed about those things. Like for an example, if someone is going to say, I'm gonna provide 200,000, they're gonna ask, how many people are you looking to serve, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how do you come up with that number? Uh, and then it also throws the committee off just a little, even though we'll continue to talk about this, is when money is given, when you think in terms of your two buckets, money's given in the medical area for, for um, doctors, right? Because the first question is, that training should really be coming from someplace else, right? Or who should be paying for that training someplace else? So that's why we're asking the questions about workforce and jobs and all that other stuff because the committee is feeling, I'm sure, a little anxious about this whole notion of spending money on doctors, okay? <laughs> Although we love doctors. Don't we love doctors? We all love doctors. Uh, 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 Senator Drehheim. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And, and I, I assume this is getting laid over. Yes. And I, I do have the A3, but I know we're running short on time. Um, and I know we have a couple more bills to get through. Uh, if this does move forward, I would really love it if my E3 reporting language, which Senator we put on, I put it, I have an amendment on every bill that comes through, mm -hmm. just reporting back to us on how well the program's doing. Um, I won't offer the amendment, but I just would like to work with you if this does move forward that we put some kind of language on it. And, and thank you, yes, Senator Drehan. And I'm certain that Senator McCoy would also be willing to help talk through some of the language there and so we can get a clear understanding. Um, uh, um, and so that is what I'll say there. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and um, I think I had some of the same uh, key words pique my attention through this discussion. And, and one thought for you and the author would be, um, we already have a process for, for uh, fulfilling competitive grants, and that's, that's through DEED. We have an established protocol. We have established criteria for what is appropriate coming out of the Workforce Development Fund, and I just have a concern that we're going to be making this appropriation potentially uh, to a third party to basically do the work that DEED already does, and it seems a bit redundant and another reason why I think this is probably an, an inappropriate use of our funds. Any other questions or comments for the testifiers? Seeing that, let me say this. Senator Mayquay, thank you for your patience, and thank you to the testifiers for your patience and, uh, and willingness to answer some questions and help bring clarification. Uh, but again, this bill would be laid over for possible inclusion, and as we do with any bill, if it makes it you know, to, to be included in our omnibus bill. We try to talk to you and try to figure out the best ways by which to deal with it in real time and, and how to make sure that it lines up with workforce development because that is a big issue from this committee versus like general fund dollars, right? It's still jurisdiction still becomes an issue, but we'll certainly continue to talk to you about it. Any, any closing comments, uh, Senator May Quaid? Because we always like to give the author an opportunity to say something in closing. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and members for the really great discussion and I appreciate the questions and I think it shows that you do a lot of good diligence in your committee around the work that you do. Um, similarly, we did a lot of really do, good due diligence on this bill to make sure that it does fit your committee and I hope that uh, when time comes time to put your omnibus bill together that this makes it in. Thank you so much, Senator Maycoy. Thank you to the testifiers. Thank you so much for being here. With that, Senate File 3502 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Members, we, uh, if, uh, we're going to try to get through these last two bills. We're going to ask the others who are coming up that you, you know, be as succinct and as thoughtful as possible. We have Senate File 4435 from Senator Howe. We have Christy Sovereign and David Booth. Could you come up to the testifiers table as well? Um, Senator Herr. Uh, 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 what, what, once you are, I'm here. Oh, I said Senator Howe. I'm sorry, Senator Her. Senator Howe is on my mind. I'm sorry about that. I don't know how and why he's on my mind. Senator Her. So thank you, Senator Muhammad, for reminding me that I said Senator Howe instead of Senator Her. Uh, uh, Carlin Dole Fontaine wasn't going to give me any help or support. She was going to sit there and let me say the wrong word uh, and say the wrong name. Senator Her. 
her. I know who you Thank are. You. Thank <laughs> you. If you identify yourself for the record, give us your opening statements, and then your two testifiers will be able to uh, testify for two minutes each. Senator Her. Thank you, Chair Champion and members. Uh, Senator Fong Her is here. Um, so uh, Senator File 40, 4435 is about Sweet. Special Olympic USA 2026 in Minnesota. And when it comes to Special Olympics, I'm reminded and also inspired by the story of Loretta Claiborne, who was born with physical and intellectual disabilities, yet she overcome the odds and won gold medals under many dis disciplines. More importantly, the Special Olympics allowed Ms. Claiborne to discover her gifted abilities, where she became fluent in Spanish, Russian, and American Sign Language, despite her intellectual uh, disabilities. So I'm honored uh, to be asked to carry Senate File 4435 to provide an opportunity for our state to make a one-time investment in an exciting and meaningful event. In the, summer, in the summer of 2026, Minnesota will be hosting the 2026 Special Olympics USA Games. The mission of the event is to create an inclusive event that celebrates ability, delivers the highest quality experience for all who participate, and leaves a legacy of positive change in Minnesota. The event is projected to be one of the largest sporting events in 2026 over the course of the week-long program. This event is an important and unique opportunity for Minnesota to elevate an event focus on disability community, a critical but at time overlooked part of our inclusion and diversity effort of our state. Additionally, the event is anticipated to have a significant economic impact here in the Twin City, nearly $75 million. The Senate file 44, 35, seek $4 million in one-time funding for 2026 Special Olympic Games, and I ask for your support, members and chair champion, and stand by to, for a question, and my, my testifier, and include Ms. Christie Sovereign and David Booth, and either of you can proceed. Thank you, Senator Herb. Uh, we will now go to Christy uh, Sovereign, if you would be so kind as to uh, state your name for the record and provide us your two minutes of testimony. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. We really appreciate the opportunity to be here and for your consideration of our bill. And Senator Herb, thank you. I'm Christy Sovereign. I'm the CEO for the 2026 Special Olympics USA Games. Related to the bill, the most important thing that I'd like you to take away is that while the games will be anchored in sporting activity, we're really hosting a humanitarian event. The Special Olympics mission is to improve the lives of people with intellectual disability, and it does so via a focus both on and off the field. On the field, we'll host 17 sporting competitions, but off the field, three important priorities will be advanced. The first is health and wellness. Healthy Athletes is a Special Olympics program focused on addressing challenges that people with intellectual disability have with access to health services. Accordingly, free health services, free screenings will be provided to athletes during the games. The second priority is advancing inclusion in youth. We want inclusion to be a focus at the earliest age as possible. Therefore, our efforts will include Young Athlete Program, which unifies children with and without disabilities from the ages of two to seven, and it'll also include Champion Schools Focus to grow the number of schools with unified sports programming across the state of Minnesota. Finally, our third priority is athlete employment. Only 18.5% of people with intellectual disability are employed to the level of their ability. We want to see the inclusivity of sport move to the workforce. So our priorities in this space include a unified work fair that gives both athletes and corporations the tools that they need to address these statistics of under and unemployment. The event is expected to generate an economic impact of over $75 million, but more so, we're looking to address an underserved community. And funding is particularly important to enable these off-the-field priorities. 
We're really keen to bring Minnesota together and with the platform we have, leave a lasting legacy of inclusion across the state. Thank you so thank very you. much. We, uh, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for that important information. We will now go to uh, uh, Mr. David Booth for your two minutes of testimony. Welcome to the committee. State your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, my name is David Booth. I'm an athlete and member of the Board of Directors for Special Olympics. I'm here on behalf of Special Olympics athletes and others from the proud state of Minnesota to share a vision of what the USA Games can bring to our great state of Minnesota. Minnesota has made important strides to help people feel more included, not excluded. There are many health and wellness services offered and future investments planned to help those without intellectual disabilities and with disabilities to create one Minnesota. And for this, we are grateful, but there is always more work to be done. The USA Games and its platform of sports gives us a once in a lifetime opportunity to play the games we love while showing our appreciation as athletes to the people who've devoted time and resources to help us prosper while at the same time unifying the community in Minnesota and beyond through the power of sports. These games in 2026 are an opportunity, an opportunity for which Minnesota can take the light that's been growing from the efforts conceived by all Minnesotans. We have the chance to spread this light to the rest of the nation while showcasing the unbelievable unity and resiliency of our athletes. We are Minnesota. The place of opportunities exist while helping to change the world for the better. With your help, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, we can ensure that the 2026 Special Olympics USA Games is able to set a path and ignite a movement from which we hope the rest of the nation will follow. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for your time for considering our fundraising request. Thank you so very much. And we'll go to Senator Dreheim for the A2 Amendment. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair. And um, Senator Hurry, as you know, I always offer this amendment. I, I'm going to hold off. I understand it's going to be laid up laid on the table and just hope that uh, Senator Champion will work with me on some reporting language moving forward. I know we're short on time. Um, I love the Special Olympics, so thank you both. Uh, Senator Hur, I'd like to sign on to the bill. I, th I think it's important. I think this is something that we should do here in Minnesota. Um, I, I like the uh, health screening. I like the work the Special Olympics do. Um, I had an uncle that worked really close down in Iowa and it changed his life, his whole world. The experience that he got working with the athletes. And, uh, sorry. <laughs> so thank you for bringing it forward. I, I really appreciate it. And chair, if we have funding, I really think this is something that we should do. Um, you love sports, I love sports. <laughs> what a great opportunity to showcase the whole country, Minnesota. And I know money's tight, but if we do have some funds, I think this with 75 million economic impact to the state, um, the people that participate <coughs> in these sports are so passionate and loving. <coughs> thank you. And thank you, her, for bringing it forward. Thank you, thank you Senator Dre. Thank you. Um, uh, Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I just want to, you know, uh, reiterate, you know, support for Special Olympics. You guys do a great job. But I do have just, you know, one business-related question is, is what's the total cost of putting on the event and how much of that is coming from non-state government sources? Uh, uh, Ms. Sovereign, is that a question for you? Yeah, Mr. Chair, thank you for the question, Senator. Um, we expect that 90% of what will be required to put on the games will be privately uh, funded via corporations and, and private donors. So our ask for the $4 million is for 10%, the last 10%, to really make the games exceptional related to the legacy components that I spoke of. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Sir. So just to clarify, you know, Senator Dreheim said we're, we're expecting a $70, $75 million economic impact, but the cost to put on the games is about $40 million. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, Senator uh, Herr, notice I didn't call you Senator Howell this time. <laughs> Senator Herr, um, uh, time is of the essence, so can you give us just... Yes. 
closing uh, comments, and we'll go from there. Thank you, Senator Champion and members, and I definitely will add uh, Senator Dreinhein as a co-author to the bill, and we um, have some com commonality here, Senator Dreinhein Dre uh, Dre and I, and I know supporting is an exciting activity, but it's the humanity based, and you're more so, Senator Dreinhein, that we are connecting in that sense, so I ask for your support. Thank you so very much. Uh, and uh, with that being said, uh, Senate File 4 4435 will be laid on the table for possible inclusion. We'll ask Senator Hoffman to please come forward to present Senate File 4331. Um, I believe he also has testifiers Adam Dunnick, Jojo uh, Kilimanjaro. There we go. Uh, please approach the table. And Scott Ger Gerlicker? Yes, yeah, okay. Scott's here too. Uh, he, please be on deck. All right. No, I need, Thank you all for being chair. patient. We do have a, uh, a, a tough schedule here. So, Senator Hoffman, give us your opening statements. And Mr. Chair, members, I want to spend the next 45 minutes talking about the importance of Minneapolis music scene as it relates to what we're doing uh, in this uh, committee. I can't even get Senator Champion to smile. But Senate File 4331 is a bill providing appropriation to the Taste of Minnesota Festival. Of course, the foundation is a celebration of cultures, community, and cuisine. And you know the festival includes a wide variety of history, music, food, renowned chefs, and arts, right? Taste of Minnesota, it's actually free, unlike other festivals which cost hundreds of dollars to get in the doors. But the public partnership helped to make this event inclusive, accessible, and to Minnesotans from all all over. Here's the thing, Mr. Chair, the Taste of Minnesota organizers have been intentional to include everyone, and last year the Taste had over 68% BIPOC and women-owned vendors, businesses, artists, staff, and performers. This year's festival is going to exceed that, and believe it or not, you have a flyer in front of you, and you might recognize a few of those uh, artists that are on there, Senator champion. I will not mention 1994 and anything like that. But I, with that, I'm going to give this over to Adam Dunnick and then Chef Jojo Kilimanjaro and then Scott Gerlicher who's here as well. And there you go. All right. Mr. Dunnick, welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and we uh, and provide your two minutes of testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll try to be brief and keep it to a minute. My name is Adam Dunnick. I'm the President and CEO of the Minneapolis Downtown Council. I'm here in strong support of this bill and, and want to start by thanking Senator Hoffman for carrying it, you, Mr. Chair, for hearing it, as well as the rest of the committee. You only have to look at the last couple weeks to see what it's like downtown Minneapolis when there's a lot of things happening, from a Big Ten uh, Women's and Men's Championship Tournament uh, to some conferences at the uh, Convention Center, as well as having Target and U.S. Bank back in the office a little bit more than they have had over the, the previous previous weeks. So super excited to see what an extra 100,000 people does to downtown Minneapolis for its economic impact and its social cohesion. Um, as Senator Hoffman mentioned, this event is not is a, is a free event, so unlike having to pay to go see Taylor Swift or a Big Ten basketball game, this event is open to the public and accessible. Uh, we also work hard with Metro Transit to provide free rides. Last year there were uh, tens of thousands of free rides given on Metro Transit. And lastly, I just want to say Nicollet Avenue is Minnesota's main street, and we love to sh showcase it for this event. We're extremely proud of the work the Downtown Improvement District does every day to keep it clean and green and safe, and really proud to host this event. Look forward to making it even more successful in, in 2024. Thank you. Kilimanjaro, you are up next. Do we have the chef? Okay, there you go. If you state your name for the record and Thank give you. us your two minutes of testimony. Thank you, Chair, and everybody else. Uh, I go by Chef Jojo Kilimanjaro, chef owner of Tamu Grill and Catering, a Kenyan fusion restaurant over the Riverside neighborhood in South Minneapolis. I was a vendor last year at the Taste of Minnesota, and apart from it being a great day for sales for my business, and of course great publicity, it was an opportunity for Minnesota to showcase its diversity in terms of the food offerings, uh, everywhere from classic American hamburgers to African to Asian cuisine, Mexican, everything you can think of. So it brought a cross-section of Minnesotans downtown Minneapolis on Nicolette Mall. Last but not least, and of course it was a free event, but last but not least, while a lot of our fellow Minnesotans are down uh, in the boundary waters enjoying nature, 4th of July weekend, most immigrants and uh, transplants into Minnesota stay in town. So this is a great opportunity for all of us to come together 
for this great free event, downtown Minneapolis, Nicolet Mall. And Minneapolis downtown also needs it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so very much. We're going to Scott uh, Gerlacher. Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, my name is Scott Gerlacher. Uh, Mr. Chair, committee members, I serve as a director of security for Taste of Minnesota. And as you know, Minneapolis and Minnesota has a long history of hosting large and successful events. Last year, Taste of Minnesota was just another one of those events. As was pointed out, we had over 100,000 people in downtown Minneapolis. Uh, in order to do that, and really if you think about a uh, successful event, it's all about safety and creating a safe atmosphere for all the attendees. We were able to do that last year and we'll be doing that this year with a larger footprint. But as you might imagine, um, creating safety is both complex and costly to do so. We're, anytime you section off a large section of downtown Minneapolis, put barricades and fencing around it, uh, weapons detection systems, and bring in private security as well as law enforcement from Minneapolis, Hennepin County, the state of Minnesota, uh, that all adds to the complexity, but also creates a great sense of safety and security. One of the added benefits we saw last year, and with other events that we've had in downtown Minneapolis, Super Bowl, etc., is the connection, the positive connection between law enforcement and the community. Anytime you can create that connection, not during a crisis situation, but get those police officers, those deputy sheriffs to interact with the community in positive, uh, it's positive method. It really is, serves as almost a healing uh, perspective for some of the challenges, of course, that we've seen in Minneapolis. So very positive event. We're looking very much forward to doing it again this summer, and we look forward to your support. Thank you. Thank you so, so very much for being here. Senator Hoffman, your closing comments before we go forward to lay this bill on, on the table for possible inclusion. Thank Senator you, Hoffman. Madam. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Champion, Mr. Chair, and members for the support last year on this absolutely fantastic oh. thing. And as Senator Pratt has a question. He does. And I, I'm sorry that I was moving so fast trying to get you out of here. Because he's, he's worried, Senator Pratt, that I'm going to start talking Senator about Senator Pratt. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and same, same question I had for the other organization. Can you tell me what the total cost of the event is? And and how much is coming from non-state resources, from agencies Which one or your tes direct grants? Testifiers. Uh, they can come to the table. Yep. Come on up here. Identify yourself for the record and answer the question, please. Yeah, my name is Clayton Kearns, uh, and it's over $2 million. Um, I'm sorry, $2 it's million? Two, over $2 million operating budget for 24. So the state is picking up over, uh, almost $1.9 million of of a $2 million operating budget and only uh, about 100, 150,000 is coming from private sources. It's a sponsor, uh, a public private you know, partnership is what we're looking for and uh, we're hoping to get more sponsors this year. So. Uh, uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and how much is the city, uh, I'm specifically looking at the state, so the city's not putting in any money on this. On there this is not a direct cash infusion. Uh, sir, you got to wait until I recognize Sorry. you. Then you can got be it. so ha you can be enthusiastic about answering Great. to the testifier. Uh, the city is not putting a direct cash infusion into the event, but they are supporting the event uh, through other uh, other ways. Senator Brett, uh, what other ways? No, that's my questions, Mr. Chair. I just uh, you know I was so impressed with the ninety percent coming from private private donations on the on the. Uh, Special, uh, Special Olympics. I was hoping we'd hear more about private and and partnership uh, in covering the cost of this program because it's it's a really great event. Um, I just hope we can figure out a way that we can get better participation financially on it. Any other questions before, uh, for any of the testifiers of Senator Hoffman? First one was last year. Senator Hoffman, now you can give your closing comments before we lay uh, uh, Senate File 4331 on the table for possible inclusion. Mr. Chair, thank you very much. I think you're going to love the lineup this year because, you know, there's Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis are coming back. We got, you're going to gavel me out. But there's some great music that's absolutely the Minneapolis sound, and I appreciate you being there, and I appreciate your support. And thank you very much for letting us show the, showcase this. With great, that being said, event. Senate File 43. 31 will, will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you so much, Senator Hoffman. Members, thank you for your patience today. Thank you also for looking at the um, uh, policy bill. It went up on, on Monday after committee. Thank you to uh, staff who was so helpful in that as well. Thank you, Senator uh, Muhammad, for coming forward. Uh, should I call you someone else? Okay, okay Senator Muhammad. Uh,
Okay, just don't call you how. I got it. Uh, thank you so very much. With our business being concluded, we are now adjourned. <laughs>